Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real World Productivity Podcast. I'm Adam, and today I'm talking with Liam Martin about his background, Time Doctor, and the use of technology to increase productivity, organization, remote teams, and so much more. So stay tuned, and we're just going to dive right into it. So first of all, uh, welcome, Liam. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Yeah, very much. And let's just jump right into it. You know, I like to start out with a question and just let you talk about, uh, you know, your background and your experience just in general or in the field of productivity so we can understand a little bit more about who you are, where you're coming from. So if you don't mind sharing just a little bit or as much about yourself as you want to, uh, let's just start there. Sure. So a uh, human being on planet Earth, more specifically, <laughs> I'm in Ottawa, Canada. I'm Canadian. And uh, we have two companies and actually one conference. Our two companies are timedoctor.com and staff.com. And we also run a conference on building and scaling remote teams called runningremote.com, which is the largest conference on uh, specifically that subject. And started Time Doctor about seven years ago when actually right out of grad school, I ended up having a pretty interesting problem, which was I started a tutoring company and I couldn't really measure how long tutors were working with students because it, they were virtual tutors. And I would end up having to talk to my uh, tutor and say, hey, did you actually work with this kid for 10 hours? Because they said you worked with work with them for five. And then <clears throat> the tutor would say, of course, I worked with them for 10. So I'd end up having to pay the student or sorry, the tutor for the full 10 hours and uh, only pay the, or refund the student for five hours. And I was end up losing money in that deal. So Yikes. Time Doctor was a tool to be able to very specifically measure how long someone was working and to be able to quantify that very precisely, not only for client work, but then also for just general productivity, which is what uh, a lot of our customers use it for today. Nice, okay. Yeah, and I saw they uh, might have, I think, been the intro to your last running remote conference uh, in 2018, and it, that was interesting, which is going to definitely guide some of my questions, because I had some questions about team building. Sure. Uh, but I thought that that was really interesting, because you started off with talking about uh, your experience in grad school and how you realized that that prop, being a lecturer was definitely not going to be the the path for you to, um, to take down. So when you were in grad school, did you... Uh, feel like you, you know, got some special or not so special help in terms of productivity? Or do you feel like that once you kind of took the entrepreneurial route, that that's where you really kick things into gear as far as productivity organization and whatnot? I got to be honest with you, Adam, I'm so horrible at productivity, I'm horrible <laughs> at productivity, but we've specifically built tools to force myself into a state of productive activity. And I think that if you have that type of a problem, eventually you just get so frustrated that you scratch your own itch and you build a product out like that. But grad school for me was not the most productive place, I think. Um, I don't know if we want to get into a conversation about higher levels of education, but I kind of recognized that grad school wasn't for me. I remember I was going to teach a class or I taught a class for the very first time. I was a TA for about six years and then ended up teaching my first class as a graduate student and it was horrible. I thought that I was going to do such a great job. I ended up, I started with 300 students. I ended up with like below 200 by the end of the year and got some of the worst university professor reviews in the entire department. Oh, Basically some of the worst they've ever seen. I remember stepping into my graduate, um, my, uh, my professor's office, the person that was, that was running my, my thesis. And I said, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you're not. <laughs> and I said, so where does that leave me? He's like, well, you know, you got to keep doing this for the next 20 to 40 years before you actually get to do anything really fun in graduate school as a, as a professor. So either get better at teaching or, or figure out another solution. So I, I got a master's degree instead of pursuing the PhD and, uh, never looked back on on that situation. And I recognized that I really liked education. I just didn't necessarily like the package that education was currently being placed in. Mm. And thankfully today, I mean, that was, that was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Today, education has really changed where there are multiple ways to learn and there are multiple ways to be productive. So just sitting in a lecture hall is not the only way that you can actually get information into your brain. Uh, you can get information into your brain through podcasts and you can 
you know, run them at double the time. So it's very easy to be able to get information into your mind quickly and effectively, and you can listen to the best educators in the world. And that was something that kind of really inspired me going back all the way to the beginning to talk about productivity. Now I am learning a lot more, but I'm learning in a way that I think is uh, very different from the classical ways of learning. And then I'm augmenting that obviously with tools like Time Doctor so that I can measure exactly what I'm doing and how productive I am just in general. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Interesting. Uh, look back on it. And I agree with you a lot of it. That's interesting. We actually share some similarities there. I did the same thing. I ended up in uh, graduate school and was like, I went ahead and said, yeah, master's degree is for me. There's no way in hell I could do a PhD and do this type of stuff, um, which my wife ended up doing. So I, I completely understand that point of view. Uh, you'd mentioned something about, uh, you know, you said, I'm not really that productive or I'm not that, you know, I've built these tools around me, but I'm interested. Do you think that you're more of like a kind of ready fire aim type of person, or do you feel that your, your general, you feel like you, uh, maybe like a lack of motivation or procrastination and you've had to build systems around either of those, or is it something else entirely? I'm a fire <laughs> ready aim uh, yeah. person, frankly, I, so I'll, I can give you an example of running remote, the conference that we've built. I had the, I was sitting down with one of my operations managers and who's now the GM of the entire conference. And we were asking these questions about how remote teams are built. And we really couldn't find any information on it. You could find information on like, if you have one or two employees, or maybe you have a small team of five to 10, but you couldn't really get actionable blog posts or there's nothing written on like how to manage a team of 100 people or 1000 people remotely. So we said to ourselves, man, there's nothing there. We'd really love to learn that. So we just decided to build that conference. And I was the one that just said, okay, let's cut a check and figure it out. And then you kind of, you, I find particularly with productivity, you can scare people or I can scare myself by actually just making a very strong action, like mm -hmm. cutting a hundred thousand dollar check for a venue <laughs> when you don't have a single ticket sold. And then yeah. magically <laughs> things seem to happen that you just, if you had not cut that check in the first place, you wouldn't have been able to build out anywhere near as quickly. Uh, so I think a lot of these things kind of boil down to there's the efficiency of how fast you're running, but then there's also the conditions by which you're running. So if you're just going for a friendly jog, yeah, having the best Nikes in the world, i.e. Time Doctor, is great. It's going to allow you to run faster. But you know what will even get you to run faster? If there's a pit bull behind you <laughs> running at you. So you can usually, that's that's great for, yeah. for, for very fast spurts, right? Eventually you're going to burn out and you have to kind of recognize that. But I like to use both of those separate techniques where I'll have a jog week and then maybe I'll have a pit bull week. Hmm. It really depends on where I'm at and what I want to accomplish. That makes a lot of sense. I, I think that's a good note to bring into and to let people know about is yeah, definitely having that that downtime and then also recognizing if this is a good um, uh, method for yourself, it, you know, kind of the deadline idea, or like you said, it's kind of like the burn the burn the boats to take the uh, take the island and, and go for it. You definitely need to know yourself before you do this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, all right. You mentioned Time Doctor, um, and I'd like to, people to know about this. Do you mind, I mind taking some time and kind of explaining what Time Doctor is and, and how this can help people? Sure. So right now I am... I have a task in my task list, which is uh, meeting with Adam. And we have been running it for approximately 16 minutes and 22 seconds. And at the end of this particular podcast, I'll be able to measure that against all the other podcasts that I have under the podcast project and figure out exactly what I did. So how much time did I spend on Zencaster? How much time did I spend on Gmail, on Skype? Um, anything, Google Calendar, all of the different applications. And what that data is in essence, why I'm collecting all that data is number one, I'm able to measure exactly what I did. So not only measure how long the task took, but what websites and applications I was interacting with during that time. But more importantly, at the end, I can start to gain insights from that data. And we use some machine learning. Uh, we use a lot of other kind of little 
secret things in the background to be able to gain insights into how efficient workers are and then how they can actually improve their overall productivity, which is really what we are entirely focused on. Our big thing is, can we make people more productive? Uh, and sometimes that actually brings us in really counterintuitive directions, which is quite difficult when you're dealing with Fortune 500 companies and I can show someone a very clear quantitative analysis that says that if your employees work two hours less per day, you'll actually increase output and they'll look at me like I'm from Mars. But the data is very clear. Those types of, we're basically trying to communicate that type of data to decision makers so that they can make employees not only more productive, but also happier people. Okay, interesting. So uh, you mentioned that it, it collects all the data, you, like you'd be able to have a podcast project and go back and look and compare. Does it do some of the organization of the data itself so that you don't have to kind of do this I guess, manually? Or are you able to go in and look at this and say, ah, okay, like when I did this podcast, it, it took me, um, you know, this long, I guess, I, or how, how does that help you? And in what ways is it kind of organized for you? So I have, I actually have a podcast project mm -hmm. and then I have tasks. So the task today is, is meeting with Adam and then it's under the podcast project. So I'll be able to see all of my prep time. I'll even, I even have a task under that project called like preparing for podcasts, where I'm checking out your site, maybe scrubbing through a couple of your podcasts, trying to get in the feel for it. And then I'm quantifying where I'm putting that amount of time throughout my day. And then on the other hand of uh, that entire process is I'm looking at the results. So how many people ended up signing for a tr signing up for a trial of Time Doctor or buying tickets to running remote, mm. which is why I'm here, and then I can measure those inputs and outputs and see, well, should I spend more time on Facebook ads, as an example, as opposed to uh, doing podcasts? And actually, uh, to just kind of break down the analysis of that, podcasts are one of the best ROIs that we could possibly have found uh, for particularly moving uh, conference tickets. It's, it's very interesting and we should have recognized that at the very beginning, but when someone listens to you for 45 minutes, mm. they, uh, they usually want to buy a ticket, uh, especially if they listened all the way to the end. So that's something that we've recognized is a very productive application of our time, but we wouldn't have been able to actually measure it as precisely as we do without having all of those tools in place. That's interesting. So with the results, are you able to either tie that in or do you go back in and say, um, manually add something in and say, you know, okay, we're looking at our, whatever our shopping cart we're using. We've had, uh, you know, 20 sales over the past month. How are you able to attribute those, for example, to the podcast just by like tracking links and normal stuff like that? Yeah, we'll, we'll be tracking just referral traffic or we'll be tracking, tracking UTMs and or if people have coupon codes. Okay. So sometimes someone wants to be able to throw up a coupon code and that's pretty easy for us to be able to measure all of that data. Usually, and not to get into to kind of the technical side of it, but approximately 50 to 60% of our uh, ticket sales last year ran through some type of referral or coupon code. So then we infer the, the we infer that as the mean. So basically we just throw out any conversions that don't come from, that we can't track because you can't track them. Mm -hmm. And then you just assume that that's the entire net. And we found out that for the amount of time that it would cost me and meaning like I have a cost, I'm, a, I'm an employee inside of the company, I get paid uh, a salary. We looked at the return on investment and recognized that it created two interesting factors, which was number one, it moved tickets pretty profitably. And then secondarily, uh, people gained more of a rapport where maybe they wouldn't have purchased a ticket initially, but they are interested in purchasing a ticket next time. Whereas if we had just given them a Facebook ad or some other type of marketing that isn't as intimate, they wouldn't have been able to get acts. They, they wouldn't have cared about us mm -hmm. as much as if they listen to two or three podcasts or listen to a YouTube video. We actually have an entire breakdown of how we did um, the first running remote conference and broke down broke it down to the dollar of where our customers were coming from, what methods we used to be able to acquire them. Again, we're very our company culture is very quant heavy, so everything is measured. 
uh, we're, we're a time tracking company, so it's, it's appropriate for us to be able to <laughs> yeah. do that type of stuff. I know that m many other people probably wouldn't approach it that way, but for me, that was something that is just the way that I address problems. Uh, so if it sounds very weird to your listeners, I apologize. It's just the way I'm built. Huh. Well, no, and hopefully it doesn't. I think, you know, it's a good reminder to anyone that as far as, uh, so I have the Productivity Academy, and then I'm also involved with a business called Semantic Mastery, where we do local digital marketing training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've entered that phase where know your numbers is becoming very important. You know, we've been around for a few years, we've grown, and now it's important to look at what you're exactly talking about and saying, okay, where's the ROI at? Um, you know, we know where roughly where it's coming from, but there's a certain level where we need to be able to dive in and say, you know, where do we where do we apply our 80-20 rule to? What is it we're going to double down on? Um, and so I think that this is, is really important stuff. And you can definitely get lost in the details, but if you don't know where your results are coming from, then you're just guessing. So. Absolutely. And I think that you'd be blown away at how many companies have no real idea of where their conversions come from. And uh, that's terrifying to me, particularly in today, in the kind of space that we're in now, the time that we're in now, where you can measure absolutely everything if you if you have the energy and the wherewithal to be able to do it. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, I mentioned that I saw the uh, the intro to the Running Remote Conference and uh, had some questions about uh, team building for you, but that's all right, and I can turn off my speakers. Uh, <laughs> so... When we, uh, when I saw the video, rather, um, you know, it was an interesting hearing about your background, like we talked about, um, and then transitioning uh, into doing what you're doing now. But when did you start building a team? Did you was that an immediate, like, okay, I'm going to start building a company, I'm going to immediately build a team? Um, was it something that you said I'm going to start this project, and eventually you realize, oh, you know, there's no way I can do this myself? What What was the background there? For all everything that we've ever done, we've always built teams first, and. I kind of hearken this back to a philosophy that I hold, which is you can't scale on your own. I think mm -hmm. that if you really want to build, um, and because you have experience in, in digital marketing, I think you'd probably be able to understand this more than, than most other people. Any really smart marketer that's good at their job can probably build a million dollar a year business. I think that that's relatively someone who is living in the va living in silicon valley right now has access to all of this type of information is well educated can probably build a million dollar saas business or a million dollar agency um, relatively easily however it's almost impossible for someone to build a 10 million dollar business in the same way hmm. so what you really need to be able to do and this is something that i've recognized and it definitely applies to productivity you need to be a good manager and you need to learn how to manage other people and allow them to be able to execute for you. So anything that I do now, and I'd love to be able to meet a business where I could have a $20 million a year business that would be run off of me in a computer. Uh, I have not found that type of business yet. And I just do not think they necessarily exist. And I'm sure there's probably one or two instances where people could prove me wrong, but they may last for a year or two and then disappear. There may be opportunities, but they're not businesses. Uh, so if you want to build large, large businesses, you have to be able to, number one, be good at managing other people. And then number two, you need to be able to figure out how to maximize their productivity, which is actually quite different from maximizing your own productivity. Because people work in very different ways. You can provide them the getting things done paradigm if you want, but very few people actually follow that. What we've found the most successful is creating very specific KPIs and then breaking that down, creating a very clear communication between the manager and the employee on how they need to execute on those particular KPIs and then uh, provide the mentorship to be able to hit those particular targets. And that sounds kind of simple, but it's actually quite complicated when you break it down and oh, yeah. you can spend years on becoming good or bad at that. But the people who become really good at it, they're the ones that build big companies and the ones that become that aren't very good at it. I think they kind of languish um, and they never really get to where they need to go. Interesting. So uh, for the listeners, so KPIs, key performance indicators, can you give us an example of maybe one or two? Like what are ones you uh, obviously supposed to be different for different positions? Um, but can you give some examples? 
Sure. So inside of our SEO team, which is search engine optimization, and it's the team that basically writes blog posts, and then we promote those blog posts so that they get backlinks to those posts and get ranked in Google. The key, the KPI, i.e. the compass metric, that's another word that we use. Basically, the there's a single metric that each employee is answerable towards. And we use that as the compass metric because it ties in all the sub metrics below it. And that metric for the SEO team is cumulative domain authority. So it basically means the amount of uh, the amount of domain authority accumulated points that someone gets per week or per month when they're doing link building for us. So let's say we're going to do link building for episode 16 of the Productivity Academy with uh, on following up with an action taker. Mm -hmm. We would reach out to a whole bunch of people. We would say, hey, this is a really great episode. We'd love it if you could link it at this particular place. And we have a team of researchers that would provide those opportunities to the linker. And then the linker would reach out to those people, probably have a seven to eight email exchange, and then we would exchange a link. So they would link to our stuff and maybe we would do something for them. And from that process, uh, I don't know what the product Productivity Academy is in terms of domain authority, mm -hmm. but let's say you're a domain authority of 40, then you'd collect 40 points uh, as the linker. And then if you do another blog post and you link to another or another website links to you, maybe that other blog has a domain authority of 20. So you have 40 plus 60 points. And the reason why we do this is if you just measure links, then most linkers will actually go after the easiest mm. websites humanly possible. So they'll go after really low domain authority and you want high domain authority. One is like you just start your blog and 100 is Facebook. Yeah. You want the really good links, you don't want the really crappy links. So we amalgamate that into a score and then at the end of the year or end of the month, everyone is measured and you're measured monthly, quarterly and, and yearly uh, on that particular metric and we just break it down like a sales team. Yeah. So. That's an example of how we run that. It's very, very clear. It's very difficult to beat, to kind of play with those numbers. Okay. So they can't, you know, they can't bull their, they can't, they can't get around. I was going to swear right there, but I know that the podcast <laughs> is illegal. They can't swear on podcasts. Uh, <clears throat> so you can't get around that particular metric. It's very, very clear to everyone and everyone shares that that data point with everyone else inside of the team. So it's just ultra clear and, and very easy. And you know whether you're doing a good job or you're doing a bad job. Um, so that's an example. Nice. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm literally personally curious. And I think the next step for some people too would be like, would Time Doctor help people um, be able to do this better as far as either any guidance on setting KPIs or obviously as far as tracking them? Sure. So just going back to the SEO example, as an example, uh, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, we usually, if someone is not performing well, we can go into their data and we can find out how much of their time they're putting into email versus putting into the phone versus putting into doing research. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a linker that I spoke to last month. He was spending time researching and this is why he wasn't performing as well as anyone else on the team. And then we looked at the top performers. We found out that they found very little, they spent very little time on researching. Well, then when we tunnel down into the data a little bit more, we actually found out that there was a new researcher that was connected to this new linker and the new researcher was underperforming. Mm. So someone would send out a hundred emails and 40 of them would bounce because the researcher wasn't doing a good job. So we were actually able to discover that this guy was doing his own research. And instead of actually throwing the researcher under the bus, he was covering for that researcher. Oh, wow. So he was going out and doing, he was doing the work for the researcher because they were friends. So it's very interesting how the data can kind of communicate this interesting story mm -hmm. where we had to sit down with the researcher and uh, the linker and say, you're doing your buddy's job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's why you're not succeeding. And that's why you're in trouble. You need to, you should have spoken to us months ago and you didn't. And uh, you can't keep up with this, you know, yeah. you can't keep up with this type of charade anymore. And then we all kind of sat down in one room. Uh, we are now retraining the researcher. And now he has a new researcher 
that is tied with a new researcher is tied with that linker and his productivity has gone back up by about a third in terms of cumulative domain authority. So we're able to kind of see that that date. It, basically, this is all tied through Time Doctor. And usually we're measuring for problems. We're not necessarily measuring for success. The only thing that we measure for success on Time Doctor for is we try to identify what makes a productive employee. So what is why is a successful employee successful? Where do they spend their time and what do they spend their time doing while they're working? And that also gives us some very interesting insights as well. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So something else you had mentioned was, um, you know, the, the people who have, or people, entrepreneurs, business owners, whatever, um, that you see being the most successful are the people who are able to um, manage and increase others' productivity by doing things like KPIs. Um, do, what are some, you know, the biggest obstacles you see uh, that being one of them, but for people who are trying to grow a business, is there anything else that you see that like, you know, clearly like people who do X, uh, you know, and Y are successful, whereas people who don't are not successful. I would probably, I can speak to remote and non-remote businesses. Mm -hmm. um, remote businesses very specifically, it all boils down to process documentation. So do you have your processes in place and can you actually communicate those processes effectively to your uh, to the people that you're managing. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be remote businesses. And then uh, non-remote businesses, which is definitely applicable to remote businesses as well, is the ability to just make sure that those people are staying accountable, mm -hmm. uh, the people that you manage. So can you effectively manage people and make sure that they, uh, and this also is kind of outside of <clears throat> things that I think you should probably always be doing, and I'm assuming that you would be doing if you are a business owner, which is the employees understand what your company stands for. You, They understand why they're actually working at that company. They're not just working there for a check. They're doing something that they find really interesting or is exciting to them. As an example, our company's mission statement is we want to empower people to work wherever they want, whenever they want. Mm -hmm. So that's the core mission statement of everything that we do inside of our company. Um, so that's why we can build a product like Time Doctor, and then we can also build a conference like Running Remote. They're two very different things, but they connect to the same mission statement. And then we communicate that very clearly when we hire someone saying, hey, you know, if you don't like remote work, you probably shouldn't work here. You'd be blown away at how many people we would have a second interview with, and we would ask them about remote work, and they would tell us, uh, that they don't really like working remotely. Well, that's probably not the right person for yeah, us. Uh, particular, yeah, especially if they're not passionate about it, if they're not excited about expanding out remote work and making sure that people just have more freedom and flexibility in the way that they work. So you need to have that done first. And then once someone is actually excited, they ha there's a right cultural fit, then you just need to get them working productively. And that really just boils down to management making sure that it's very clear where they're putting their time and how uh, how effective their time is being applied to the job mm -hmm. so that they're meeting all their KPIs. And if you can do that, then everything works. I would, however, say <clears throat> actually one of the worst things that you can do, and it's something that kind of it, it pulls, once people are by, past like I'd say 30 or 40 people, this starts to kind of pull into their organizations is people that are really good at their jobs, but don't mit, don't match the culture. Okay. So people who are like your top salesperson, as an example, uh, maybe treats the rest of the team like crap. Mm. Those are very difficult decisions and you need to be able to get rid of those people, but they're very, it's very difficult to get rid of them. But once you get rid of them, you'll actually end up making a lot more money, but it doesn't appear that way at the beginning. Um, when you're thinking, oh man, I'm going to fire my best salesperson. Well, yeah. yes, you're going to fire yourself, your best salesperson. However, that salesperson may be treating everyone else like crap and it doesn't connect to your fundamental culture. Hmm. Yeah. For me, the frame of reference, there is a book called Traction uh, by Gina Wigman, which uh, would, uh, within the last year I read for the very first time. And uh, that really hits home as far as saying, yeah, you can have the right person, but are they in the right seat or the right position? And then yep. overall, like you said, are they the right fit in the company? Because if the culture is not a fit, then they're affecting poorly everything else. So good point. I think that's. Yep. If people want to work for you, it's like going to solve 90% yep. of your problems. 
people that don't want to work for you or don't like what you're doing, they will work for you, uh, but they won't work well for you. And it takes a long time to figure that out. Well, we got time for uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, this next one is one that everyone loves hearing the answer to. Um, and I'm interested, but it's something we could all probably go down the rabbit hole. But as many or as few tools or apps, what do you find yourself using? Obviously, Time Doctor, but what else do you use to stay organized or productive? I use uh, Slack, obviously, for instantaneous communication across the team. I also use Basecamp quite a bit, and we use Jira for project development for developers. An application that I've recently fallen fallen a little bit in love with is Fellow, hmm. fellow.co, and it allows you to be able to provide meet, uh, run through the points of a meeting virtually and then create action points out of that meeting that then you can push into tools like Time Doctor, as an example. And I've been in love with it because I actually have your meeting right here because we had it in our Google Calendar and I can write in points and I can th put down points that I think I'm gonna remember and then turn it either into like points to discuss or action points. And it really is um, a really cool tool that I've been using recently that I think only came out a couple months ago, but it's just completely changed the way that I manage um, my direct reports. That's great. I'm gonna have to check that out after the podcast episode. Let's see. So for the very last question uh, today, um, I love this one personally, but what book or maybe two or three books do you recommend the most people right now? I would say anyone that's pursuing business, uh, I would say probably Peter Thiel's Zero to One. It's, probably, it's one of the best theoretical frameworks to start with if you're building a technology business, which is the vast majority of people that I work with. Mm -hmm. And then the best book that I found on management which is relatively recent, is a book by Kim Scott called Radical Candor. And it is a book on uh, being able to be radically candid with people. And I don't know if you're like me, Adam, but I'm more the really nice guy that ends up when someone gives me crap work, I'll say, ah, well, okay, yeah, thank you. This, this is good. I can work with this, as opposed to saying, this unfortunately is not good enough. Here's the things that we need to do to be able to fix this problem. And it would end up having, I'd end up having a lot of people that I would fire and then they would be completely surprised because they only heard positive stuff from me mm. because I was holding back on actually telling them the real way that I thought because I felt that that was socially awkward. So for me, uh, Radical Candor gives you a very specific framework on how to actually get past that. And it's been great for me over the last year. Oh, Stan, that's a good one. I think I'll have to check it out. I've, I've certainly worked on being able to do exactly that or to say no to things, but I think that's kind of a lifelong, uh, for most people, you got to get, get used to it and find better ways of doing it so it helps both sides. So it sounds like a great book. Yeah, my my uh, one of the things that I would always say that I haven't truly been living by uh, in the last couple of years is <clears throat> the secret to life is being comfortable, having uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> Usually if there's an uncomfortable conversation or something that you are apprehensive about doing, the moment you do it, you will automatically feel better. And you should think about that, particularly in your work world. Every time you think to yourself, oh man, I really need to talk to Adam about his productivity or I really need to talk to Adam about his KPIs. Things are not going too well. Mm -hmm. Once you have that conversation, you will immediately feel better. Adam may not feel better initially, but long-term he's going to be more successful in his job and it's going to make both of you and the company more successful. So you might as well just have that conversation as quickly as possible. Definitely. I think that's that's great advice. Well, uh Good answers. Some books I've got to check out. I think everyone listening should probably crack those open too. Um, I'm definitely going to be grabbing Radical uh, Candor today and, and checking that out. I hadn't heard of that before. So uh, Liam, thank you so much for a great interview. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, no worries. Thanks a lot. Well, and real quick before we go, where uh, where should people go to find out either more about you, about Time Doctor? Uh, you know, where should they go? Sure. Free trial of Time Doctor. You can go to timedoctor.com. And if you want to come to Bali and learn how to build and scale large scale remote teams, uh, running remote is happening every summer in Bali, Indonesia. We're actually doing it in a network of bamboo tree houses. It's going to be about 500 people in these big network of tree houses. It's really cool, very unique. And uh, if you're really interested in remote work, 
this is definitely the place to come. That is awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening to this podcast episode today. It can be really beneficial to hear about how others approach productivity, organization, and optimizing their business and life. And if you're interested in taking your productivity and efficiency up a few notches, head to www.productivity.academy slash start. There, you'll find my Productivity Academy guidebook, which I recommend for all listeners who want to improve their lives and know that there are better ways to getting where they want to go. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.